Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany. Welcome back or welcome if you've never been here before. Today I want to share some of my favorite quotes with you. Now I've done a favorite quotes video and in that video I did mention that this may or may not become a series. I want to make that official because I want to use these to live, okay, glean and gush. And I have some quotes from some recent reads, some older ones across genres. And um, let's just get into it. I'm gonna pull up my Kindle because a lot of these are on Kindle Unlimited. <sighs> Danger Zone by Brooke Blaine and Ella Frank. My first quote is from this book, which is the first in their Elite series that I devoured. This is an MM romance between two fighter pilots who are in a very intensive elite program where in the end only one man will come out on top. Kind of like what I did there. Anyway, Grant is the son of like a military icon. He's the type of guy that likes to dot his I's and cross his T's. He strives for perfection and he's not entirely out. Now Mateo is the exact opposite. He sees rules as bumper rails to bulldoze his way through. He is a risk-taking hotshot, which are things that Grant cannot afford. And yet the sexual tension that stems from an almost one night stand that could have happened between them when they were strangers, that just like lingers between them because Grant put a stop to it, okay? He made the safe choice that night and now they're in forced proximity due to this program and Matteo is just goading him with innuendos and like blatant invitations while like making a mockery of the program that Grant worked so hard to get into. And ironically, Mateo is also his greatest competition. <sighs> and so the moment when Grant cracks is just so gratifying. So I'm gonna read it. I won't have to do much for this first one to pull it up because it's prepared. <sighs> I love when he says, you make a mess of me, you know that? My composure, my concentration, you make me forget myself and that's dangerous. Oh my God. Every single time I read this quote, it just gets me because it's a moment that just like swings a sledgehammer against Grant's freaking armor. <sighs> the vulnerability and uttering his fear of unraveling while also confirming that it's happening. I <laughs> just love to freaking see it, okay? And isn't that the core of it? You make me forget myself and that's dangerous. Oh, I just love it. Put it in my freaking veins <laughs> every time. Okay, next I have Born Darkly by Trisha Wolf. This is the first in her duet. And this is a serial killer romance between a psychologist, London, and her patient, Grayson, who is in prison for killing nine people in a very Saw-like fashion. Okay, he's also on trial. And she's been tasked with um, assessing his eligibility for rehabilitation. And during that process, she is really confronted with the dormant parts of her that are mirrored through his psychopathy while getting caught up in a very twisted game that he's playing. And in that game, he decides that he wants her more than he needs her to be a pawn. And this really read like a psychological thriller to me, at least the first book where um, like I said, his way of killing is very Saw-like. It almost reminded me of Seven, that film with Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Spacey, and London sort of grasping um, aspects of her own personality due to the statements that he's making in their sessions. I feel like this first book, although there is explosive, tension and romance. There is a romance, 
But I think this first book is really her unraveling so she can be unleashed to accept the connection between them. The second book really delivers and gives us that HEA. And I appreciated that because of late I've been kind of side-eyeing duets and I need a strong argument for why there needs to be two books. I think <laughs> that this does a really good job of that. I feel like they needed the time, okay? And so what I like about her writing is that it's very um, referential and hard hitting the tone of it all. And there's always an argument being made. I found myself just really um, being made to think. And I want to share a quote that is in London's inner thoughts. She's recalling the last patient that she had when she was, you know, in general practice before she became a badass, you know, that's only working with criminals. So let me pull that up. I don't know, I just, oh, her writing is so thought provoking. Okay, here it is. This is what London says to her patient at the time, a patient that she believes to be a vapid human that's wasting her time. The case isn't gritty enough for her. And this is what she says. Solitude reveals who we are. Isolation is not loneliness. It's the absence of noise and distraction. It forces you to acknowledge your worth. If you must surround yourself with people, you invite distractions from the one person deserving of your time, you. And I like this quote because of the duality in it. On the surface, it rings very true. Um, I, gr I agree, like I do believe that I should be able to feed myself. It sort of reminds me of that um, warm-blooded animal argument that can be applied to emotions. So like as warm-blooded animals or species, we can self-regulate. We're not dependent on our environment like cold-blooded animals. And so I agree with that strive to um, be sound within myself and, uh, you know, I, I agree with that. It's beautiful. It's enlightening. This was really like hitting for me when I first read it. Yet then London is placed in a position, okay, that makes it very glaring, at least to me. In this quote, she is conflating the word solitude with isolation. When she says isolation is not loneliness instead of solitude is not loneliness because they are two very different things. And like I said, I love the duality in this quote. On the surface, this is very poignant. Um, and it is, it's a message, okay? But isolation is the deprivation of all senses and solitude is just the state of being alone. And there is a moment in this book where London experiences the difference because of serial killer, thriller, romance reasons. And it is in that moment that the ice queen in her is able to melt and she realizes that she needs connection. I loved that quote for this. It also kind of reminds me to be aware of having balance. If I ever have a finite answer for something that's outside of a mathematical equation that I need to be aware that I have a blind spot and remind myself to be open. Um, that's why I like conversation as opposed to debates because there's always going to be something that you can see that I do not. And so although I agree that I should know myself be able to get quiet within myself in order to discern what I find to be nourishing. I also need community. It's that balance that's so important. And I also need to be open to counter viewpoints. So I really love this quote for that. And this book is chock full of them. 
I kind of want to make the executive decision to just share one. I don't want this video to be an hour long. Please let me know in the comments if my long windedness doesn't bother you because editing me of late has been feeling it. I was not expecting my last mid month wrap up video to be an hour long. So uh, let's do some rapid fire. I have a couple of those. Rapid fire for me. Okay, so yeah. I like to clock the descriptions of our heroes or heroines the way that they are described physically, emotionally, their character. And uh, this next quote is from Lessons in Sin by Pam Godwin, where we have Father Magnus, who has been hiding out as a headmaster at, at a Catholic school. And he's done this for nearly a decade in order to suppress his darker urges and sever from his past. And he's doing a great job of it, okay? Until a new student, Tensley Constantine, is left in his care. And she is challenging him with her defiance. And mm, I love how this is also a student teacher. Uh, it's an age gap. And he really struggles with his vow of priesthood while falling for Tensley, who under the bratty demeanor is really just a lonely princess of the Constantine family that is used as a pawn to amass power more so than treated like a daughter. And I just love the way that Pam describes Father Magnus. So <laughs> Pam says, the man he pretended to be for the past nine years was a lie. He was danger, sin encased in muscle and bone a demon wearing the face of a god, the collar of a priest, and the belt of Adonis. The delicious imagery, okay? I mean, the mask, the collar, the belt encasing all that danger. Tensley had no freaking chance. I promised rapid fire, so I'll continue. Um, let's go to the stack. The next book or the next quote is from Moonstruck by Audley James. This is the third in her Necessary Evil series. And this is a series uh, centered around a family of psychopaths who were raised to be vigilante killers. And it's the first book in the series where both heroes, because these are all MM romances, are vigilante killers. And um, there is a meet cute of murder that's very illuminating for Atticus. And um, Atticus is a tightly wound psychopath that doesn't really enjoy killing, not because it's immoral, but because it's messy. And Jericho doesn't mind cleaning up the mess. And he really finds a fussy and orderly Atticus that's willing to relinquish control to him very thrilling and I loved their romance in this. The mystery plot is not my favorite of the series but the romance I love it between them and the quote that I want to pull out from this book um really tickles me because I love the reference and I love what she is doing with it um it is a moment when Jericho describes his brand of kink out of context they're having a really cute date movie night and they're watching The Labyrinth. If you don't know, The Labyrinth is a 1980s film featuring, starring the David Bowie. And Atticus is kind of poking fun at Jericho and basically saying that the only reason why it's his favorite movie is because David Bowie is hot, which would be fair, okay? But Jericho responds by saying, <clears throat> No freckles. It's my favorite movie because when he said, fear me, love me, and I will be your slave, I realized that I had a very specific kink. Jumping down, somebody willing to submit to me anytime I wanted. I realized I would do just about anything for somebody willing to be good just for 
me. <laughs> oh my god. This is such a fun and intimate window into Jericho's character and reading is personal okay this just hit me to the core because I love that this comes from the labyrinth and that he was so influenced by David Bowie and also that we get an imprinting moment for him I really like to see those because we we all have them and Mine was Peter Pan, okay? I realized early on that Tinkerbell's pixie dust could be anything that transported me and gave me happy thoughts. And so when I clocked that in junior high, movies were my freaking pixie dust. I filled my life with it and I embodied Neverland. And I still kind of live by that philosophy. I can go there any time I want to and today reading is my pixie dust but I loved hearing Jericho's imprinting moment how he shares that with Atticus and shares why and what Atticus fulfills in him mm, I'd love to see it <sighs> next um we're gonna get into Brutal Vows by JT Geisinger. I've recently read this in my Maui reading vlog. And so I'll say that this is about Spider. He's the enforcer of the Irish mafia and he's arranged to be married to a Cosa Nostra princess to forge an alliance. And Reina, who they call the Black Widow, is his soon to be bride's aunt, who is hell bit and determined on saving her from being used as a pawn um, of mafia men and being forced to marry like she was. <laughs> and the way that Spider describes Reyna, the way that he describes the reluctant pull towards her, I just love it. And so I'm gonna take you on a journey, okay? I'll try to make it quick, but I think JT is writing her damn ass off in this book. The banter is masterful, but we'll just keep it to the descriptions at first. Okay, this is what Spider says about Reyna when he first sees her, okay? His impression, if you will. Short and sweet. I said I'll be quick. I'll just get to it. The woman in the window looks like she'd only smile if she was slitting your throat. <laughs> he can tell from the courtyard and through a damn window that this woman is somebody by the way that she carries herself. He goes on to say, she's not a servant that much I know. There wasn't a hint of servitude in those flashing eyes. She looked more like a warlord about to lead an army of soldiers into battle. Oh, it's just like, I love how he describes her. It's the weight of her. It's just so felt, at least to me, I absolutely loved it. And I love how he is just so bewitched by her fierce nature and beauty and how that is such a dilemma for him because Spider has vowed to never love again. And um, I also like how he describes the way that he unravels. I'm just gonna throw that in here because I can. And we got some tabs in this. Okay, okay. This is how he describes his own unraveling. This is the strike of the match that lit the raging forest fire. This is dark, intense, and dangerous. This is need. Oh, I love that word. Sorry. Not want, and I don't like it at all. In fact, I fucking hate it. Maybe even as much as Raina hates me. <laughs> I just love to see it. I love to see it. This is the kind of tension that we're dealing with and the reason why I love it. In the moment, I think I wanna share this other one. At this point, their emotions and flesh have betrayed them, okay? There is a very meaty, angsty ground that has been laid. So later, when praise enters the chat, it's all the more gratifying. And I have to thank Jen from the Book Refuge for calling this out. Um, I clocked his uh, praise kink 
I believe in my Maui vlog too. Like I clocked it, I alluded to it, but her pulling this quote out, like I immediately tapped it after she did. And it's just, mm, after all that meaty ground was laid, it's just so gratifying. Okay, this is what Raina says in her inner dialogue. The only word I can find to describe the feeling of his recognition to me praising him as power. Giving him what he needs makes me feel strong, bold, and powerful as fuck. Is this what it feels like for him too? When he calls me his good girl and I melt, does it make him feel this incredible? This euphoric? This scene? Oh my god. The fictional compersion <laughs> that I feel while reading this. It's her having this much impact on him, the way that makes her feel, the fact that she is empowered by being able to give him what he needs. I just like how JT describes what it's like to give and receive praise. It's just delectable and I whittled this down and just kind of clock this at the moment because there are so many freaking quotes from this book. I absolutely loved it. But okay, moving back. Let's play with some Kindle ones. Let's try that. Um, let's keep in the land of praise here. Um, oh yes. Okay, another favorite quote of mine is from Contradictions by Ampersand. This is a Dramione BDSM fanfic where Hermione has found the benefits of submission through her research in order to, you know, fix her intimacy issues that stem from trauma. She ends up joining an anonymous club. They pair her with a dom that she first meets while blindfolded. And she quickly learns that it's Draco after he gives her an orgasm and drops her glamour. Okay, the duo reveal is delicious and <laughs> Draco's brand of domination is very affirming for her. It's also challenging because it requires her to be vulnerable and to take orders rather than give them. Yet when she does, he rewards her with praise and I love how it's described. So I'm gonna share it. Warmth flooded her entire body at his praise. She was predictable and it made her want to scowl. Perhaps it was the same reason that she liked rules and structure, but getting praise and recognition had always come along with a high that she couldn't find anywhere else. On Malfoy's lips though, it was like a newer, better drug and so much more dangerous more dangerous because Malfoy's praise, okay, is all the more thrilling than the accolades that she's always been chasing. What I loved about this book was that Hermione is a character that places so many conditions on her own value and they're rooted in what she can do for everyone else. And so reading her be praised for simply being as opposed to doing just did it for me. Oh, it really gives me the shivers. I love this book. Okay, the next one. Sorry, okay, let's go back to the stack because these are prepared. Um, I'm gonna share a quote from the Madness of Lord Ian Mackenzie by Jennifer Ashley. <sighs> this is the first in her Mackenzie series and Ian is the youngest of the Mackenzie brothers. He's also believed to be mad. It is inferred that he's on the uh, autism spectrum and he spent the majority of his life in asylums, which was a cruelty carried out by his father. And Beth, who is a widower, and um, who was supposed to uh, remarry before Ian intervened. I love how Beth really enjoys his quirks and his frank pursuit of her and how she really aimed to understand him. This book though, 
just the way that Ian is so enamored by her and determined and willing to do whatever it takes to have her in any way that he can, even when he doesn't believe that he's capable of love. I just loved it so much. And so I am going to read one of my favorite quotes because there are many. <sighs> this book is just so freaking good. Okay. <laughs> Ian cannot do something so simply as hold a woman's hand. He moves his thumb up my wrist and under my glove, finding points that shoot wild heat through my body. He caresses the inside of my palm with soft fingers, and then he threads his fingers through mine and holds it hard, as though teaching me that my hand belongs there with his. I mean, Ian is so tactile in this book. And he's a man of few words, but swift action. Well, few words with everyone else. He's pretty frank and direct, okay, <laughs> with Beth. But I love how this reads like freaking steam and how willing Beth is to lean into it in this book. <sighs> Ian was just too much. And I have to say, I think he's one of my all-time favorite heroes, and we just met this year. I mean, it's beyond book boyfriend for me. This is really like a poly book relationship between me, Ian, and Beth. I love them so much, okay? <sighs> Next, I have... I'm gonna do my most recent read within this stack because I absolutely have this. I clock my favorite quotes as I go. So I'm actually kind of glad that I have a channel where I can like commemorate them and put them in video form. This is fun. Thank you for being here. I have Seduce Me at Sunrise by Lisa Kleypas. This is the second book in her Hathaway series and it follows Kev Maripin, who was um, taken in by the Hathaways at, as a young boy. And since then, he has loved when the pining is absolutely mutual and it reaches a boiling point when when who was sickly after surviving scarlet fever she goes away to be hospitalized and when she returns she's desperate for kev to admit his feelings and do something about it also, she doesn't want him to continue to treat her like she's breakable. She's tired of waiting. And Kev is so determined to fight his impulse to love her out of fear. Out of fear of not being good enough, out of fear of his darkness ruining her, the whole lot of it. The angsty dance between them is absolutely delicious and I cannot get over the way that he describes his love for her. Mm. So let's find it. <laughs> All the fires of hell could burn for a thousand years and it wouldn't equal what I feel for you in one minute of the day. I love you so much there's no pleasure in it, nothing but torment. Because if I could delete what I feel for you to the millionth part, it would still be enough to kill you. And even if it drives me mad, I would rather see you live in the arms of that cold, soulless bastard than die in mine. <laughs> I mean, are you freaking kidding me? <sighs> Talk about torturous tension. It's almost like he's describing his love like a poison that he doesn't want to infect her with. It's the broody martyrdom. He is so tortured and I love it. Throughout this book, I just kept imagining Wynne in the same space with him as he's just like oozing all of this tension out of his pores. No wonder she wanted him to just make a move and stop edging her with all this simmering devotion. I could not deal with it. It's so, it was so good. It was so delicious, okay? Mm. Next, I have a quote from, hmm, let's do K. 
Kidnapped by the Pirate. This is by Kiera Andrews. This is a captor captive age gap pirate romance where Nathaniel is really being held as ransom as a means to fund Hawk's retirement. He's ready to get out of the game of pirating and yet Hawk completely is undone by Nathaniel and he just like settles underneath Hawk's skin. And I love the moment where Nathaniel catches a glimpse of that. And so I'm gonna find it. I think I said this in one of my videos, but like it is not tabbed, but I know where everything is. The writing in this is slanted and it's not printed perfectly, but I love this book so much. Okay. I love when Nathaniel says this to himself or when the author describes this. Okay. It was folly to chart Hawk's smiles, trying to collect them for his own. Folly to crave Hawk's caresses as much as the pounding of his cock, his soft chuckles as much as his fierce smirks. Yet he couldn't resist. For in these glimpses, Hawk wasn't hard muscle and bone, but shifting sand to be molded between Nathaniel's toes. Oh my God. This is what I love about this book. It's the way that Hawk softens. I mean, he starts out as this like badass alpha pirate captain and believing that all they have is physical. Even like that being physical with Nathaniel could serve as further revenge to Nathaniel's father. Yet he is the one who is ruined. It just gets me every single time. And um, I also said this before in my other video, this like demonstrates what I love in a captive captive, which is that in Nathaniel's captivity, he really is liberated. This is a moment of self-discovery for him and self-acceptance in who and what he enjoys. And it just makes me giddy every single time. I revisit this book a lot. I really need to just do like a thorough reread. <laughs> and the last quote I'll share is from Lessons in Corruption by Gianna Darling. This is the first book in her Fallen MC series. It is a student teacher age gap romance with a mature heroine. You know, I'm throwing up those, you know, that Kindle quote tab. <laughs> a mature heroine who is a recent divorcee and King is more man than she has ever encountered. It's just the lore of him how he corners her and confronts her with their connection and also challenges her preconceived notions. Um, mm, I love, oh my gosh, low battery. Sorry, I never organized during this. Bear with me, I'm new to this. Okay, <laughs> I love when she says, it was irritating that King always pushed me forced me up against the boundaries of my propriety like he wanted to fuck me from behind in front of the audience of my personal demons. It was even more irritating that it made me feel electric with tension and vitality, that colors, that the colors of the world grew neon and sharp. I love how visceral Gianna's writing is, how everything feels anew in light of King's love. Also how she describes that that's challenging, you know, to accept. It's just so good. I cannot wait for caution to the wind, okay? I am ready to go. I think that's all I'm gonna share today. But let me know in the comments if you would like a caution to the wind, like solely dedicated to that book type of vlog or if you don't care as long as I'm talking about it. But um, I wanna thank you for joining me today. I hope that you can consider subscribing and sticking around and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.